welcome to Blue Star Rising, the Templar Awakening. Michael Henry Dunn here with Reverend Maya Nartumit. And good morning, Maya. Good happy, morning. Thanks happy Thanksgiving to you. Yes, you, you'll be seeing this a little later, but it actually is Thanksgiving Day when Michael and I are doing this since we our team can't gather physically, you know. So we're doing this. And later, our dear Lenny's going to bring some food by. Yum, yum. Right. So, yeah, we'll actually have uh, a socially distanced Thanksgiving feast. <clears throat> right. But, yeah, so there's a, there's a funny meme talking about how the, some states are saying you must limit your gathering on Thanksgiving to six people unless it's a funeral, in which case you can have 30 people. <laughs> and so what we'll do is we'll have a funeral for the turkey. That's and right. Our beloved pet turkey has died. And we have a cannibalistic, well, we have a feast. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, eating, yeah, we're eating the turkey and it's a funeral. And we can, please bring yeah. refreshments. Please bring refreshments to the funeral uh, ceremony of our turkey. Cranberry sauce, you know, mashed potatoes, stuffing, things like that. So yeah. anyway. We're gonna all eat in our own domiciles, but we're gonna imagine that we're all together. And then and so on Saturday, we'll have our Zoom meeting. And so we're just gonna squish it all together. <laughs> Right. And I, unfortunately, you know, I think it, we won't have the feasting experience of, of Thanksgiving. If you're eating by yourself, you're probably going to eat less. Well, maybe you'll eat more. You know how you turn your clocks back? Yeah. You know, for the winter. Uh, I saw where somebody said, um, so there's another turn back the clock thing that happens the night before Thanksgiving, where you go to... Um, your, your scale that you weigh yourself on and you turn it 15 pounds back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't need Anticipation of, uh, of today. So anyway, welcome everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. And uh, our subject today is essentially about your soul history, our soul history, going way back. I mean, we all like to think of ourselves as, well, I do. I don't know whether it's true or not. I like to think of myself as a quote unquote old soul, right? Um, well, we're probably as souls all a lot older than we think or than we have ever stopped to imagine. And so what Reverend Maya has brought forward in the video we're about to share with you is the soul history for, for many, if not most, would that be accurate to say? Well, it's really, you know, Michael, I wouldn't even call it a soul history as much as I would call it a soul science, because I'm not saying, oh, well, you know, we all did this and this and this and that. I'm talking about more, or both was, the science of how souls came into this earth and what it means to them and what it means to their relationships, how they see the world and how they relate with one another. Yes, and I have uh, seen this in action uh, in my own relationships once I began to understand um, the science here, you know, what um, Thoth refers to as the Sonoma and the um, Paroth, which will be explained to you um, shortly in the video we're about to share, and then Maya and I will go into it um, in some depth. But of course, from incarnation to incarnation, you know, there's great variety based on heredity, genetics, environment, you know, what chunk of your karma you're choosing to work out in a given lifetime, what's going on, you know, culturally and historically and climatologically and geographically, you know, in, in that environment. And <clears throat> a fascinating thing to me about what we're about to share with you is that uh, there is a certain specific dynamic that we come in with in terms of our orientation based on this soul science you're describing, based on our moment of descent out of a divine realm, which is referred to as the lotus reality. Um, and it's... Uh, and I've observed it in, in action in myself and, and in others that, um, you know, we have shared 
with Maya and gotten some downloads, we'll call them, about when we came in. When we said you went, let's go down. Here we are in the Lotus reality, isn't it lovely? Oh, look at this lovely planet taking shape down there. Uh, we, could, we could go down there. We could explore it. We could like hang out for a while, because wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> and 50,000 years later, or however many, you know, here we are struggling to return to that divine communion. I think perhaps this is an oversimplification, but we'll get into the specifics of it uh, pretty shortly. Is there anything more you'd like to say, Maya, yeah. in introducing this video? Uh, yes, I, I would. The, the video, of course, is like most of the videos that I'm putting out here, um, is, is a reading and a commentary, a brief commentary, on something I previously wrote that both gave me. This particular was in the 1990s. And um, it's not easy to understand, especially not easy to understand. <laughs> and, uh, but, but I feel it's one of the most important revelations that I've ever received from both. Because it, if, you, if you work with it a little bit, it's not uncomprehensible by any means. It's just like you hear it for the first time, and it's kind of like, oh, let me see here. You know, so you need to hear, it's a, it's a video insert, but it's a standalone as well, and it will have a link to it below. And it's only 20 something minutes long. So you're probably gonna wanna listen to it more than once, uh, but it certainly makes sense. Once you kind of get through the science and you just see the meat and potatoes of it and how it relates, you go, wow. And then you can start seeing how it relates to the previous relationships you have had. Intimate relationships, mother-son relationships, sister-brother relationships, business partner relationships, anywhere there, there are people that are trying to relate to one another. You're going to take a look back and you're going to go, oh yeah, yeah, oh, I see over here. And you don't have to be an uh, oracle mystic to, to see uh, some of the traits that are present and in present in you as a person that relate to where you might have come into this planetary spectrum, what kind of period of time. The other thing I want to say is that I made this very simple. I say it's hard to understand, but it's like astrology. Okay, if it was astrology, and I just made a whole little video on your sun sign, this person's sun sign and this person's sun sign, that would be very informative, right? But it would leave out all the other planetary alignments and everything else that's going on. So that's what this video did. It left all the other stuff out <laughs> because it was just enough to be able to understand this basic principle. So my examples given are just basic. And we'll talk a little bit more about all of this and maybe straighten some things out, add a little bit in our conversation. But let's watch the video first, okay? All right. So seconding what Maya has just said, I would encourage all of us to, uh, I'm going to be watching it again um, for the second time now. And it's well worth um, a second or third viewing. I know in this era of shortened attention spans, you know, between um, the psychotechnologies used to brainwash us with TV commercials and, you know, and YouTube and all the rest of it, our attention span has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. Well, we offer you the wonderful gift and opportunity of expanding our attention spans. And so, this is a beautiful and, and profound video, well worth watching twice. And as soon as uh, you come back from it, we will have a fascinating talk about it. So with that, uh, please enjoy the video and we'll be right back with you afterwards. I'm reading to you from a 1995 article which I wrote for my then publication, Temple Doors. First I begin with my vision. I closed my eyes and saw under my eyelids somewhat like on a television screen, which differs from mental vision in that it is actually a neural sight, a weaving of light suspended upon a loom, upon which was something like Athena's web. It seemed to be alive and shimmering with awareness and being. 
It was composed of the four major colors, gold, red, blue, and green. The gold and red seemed to be woven close together, and the blue and green were similarly bonded. Thus the gold red and the blue green were two distinct types that came together in an intricately woven pattern, forming this beautiful living creation. I asked what I was seeing, and I received the words, The Great Mystery. Going off script here, what all this led to, because I'm not reading the entire article to you, was the understanding that I was looking at some kind of genetic field and how it connected, not just for myself, but for humanity. And that's when Thoth introduced me to the terms Sunoma and Peroth. That's S-U-N-O-M-A and P-E-R-O-T-H. So Thoth further spoke to me about this, saying, First, it is necessary to define consciousness bloodlines, or Sonoma. As human beings are incarnated, live, and then transition through the death process, they must resonate within a field of primordial soup or engendered brew. This is the cauldron, which contains three worlds of being, defined here as chaos, consciousness of chaos, and transmutation of chaos. As a soul enters this threefold mix, or matrix, through incarnation, it is at first separated from the womb of spirit. It is violated. The very act of being born is a tearing away of the veil of light that is the soul's most holy envelope. Yet through this act of violation, the first stage of the soul's development in that incarnation is begun. This is the process of divine alchemy involving separation followed by unification which creates sublime form. This sublime form must again be violated in order to attain the next rung on the spiral of sublimity. Unfortunately, Karma complicates this process and indeed makes the violation necessary each time a new cycle is begun. Thus a soul is not always in a more sublime state at the end of its current life cycle than it was when it entered, yet the matrix is in place for this evolution to occur and it does take place when the soul's separation slash will some same as personal will, aligns with its destiny. Thus, ideally, as a soul reincarnates again and again, each birth creating another separation from the spiritual womb, the soul is led to a greater stage of sublime spiritual experience. Because each soul is an envelope for a portion of the one spirit, that individual soul carries in the consciousness of its cells the greater consciousness of the one spirit. Yet because of the separation and thus duality of the world, the one spirit consciousness in the cells of the individual incarnated soul registers through a consciousness division known as the individual sunoma or ancient bloodline consciousness. Each sunoma is a being unto itself in that it expresses a continuum of mind that has a specific work to engender through its vehicle, the incarnating soul, carrying forth its awareness. Each sonoma is unique, but there are various similarities in type. They assume patterns from consciousness vectors of the incarnating experiences, such as Egyptian, Celtic, or Greek patterns of spiritual cohesion. They do not contain the magnetics of individual experience, but rather like Chondrian and Chondriana, who are worker bees of the Sonoma's physical path, the Sonoma moves into processing that aligns with the transformation of the greater world karmic magnetics. Now, I'm going to pause for a moment and, and 
talk about what Chondrian and Chondriana are. Chondrian and Chondriana are pre-embryonic life forms discovered by Dr. Mercriel, a nuclear physicist who also bioengineered the life crystals technology. They have been found to exist in all material examined to date, including rocks. They assemble themselves from pure genetic material when needed. They are present in varying degrees of activity in the healthy human body, but not to the degree needed to affect the transformation of the physical form into that of light. Chondrian, male polarity, and Chondriana, female polarity, have been observed under high magnification while literally attacking foreign substances and things like cancer in the human body. They possess superintelligence and seem able to tailor their approach to meet specific parameters, always to the detriment of the threatening organisms and to the benefit of the human body. And so this is what Thoth is calling the uh, worker bees of the Sonoma's physical path. So the Sonoma moves into processing that aligns with transformation of the greater world karma magnetics. In other words, the Sonoma is a consciousness chondriana that creates its own opportunities to penetrate the diseased cell of world karmic forms. In this process, it also transforms personal karma, but only as an after effect of its central purpose, which is to transmute the whole consciousness cell of the planet. It is important to understand that while the Sonoma is being evolved by the incarnational experience, it does not emanate from that domain, but rather from the soul's star of origin. From this model, one can readily see how the myriads of souls from various places in the universes whom have congregated here on Earth are intending to fuse their individual sonomas into a matrix of unity. This is unity beyond the understanding of race consciousness, although the weave of the lesser web does find its tendrils anchored to the greater web. While each soul carries a sonoma in their cellular vibration, which is active only through the blood energetic, many human beings on the earth have difficulty making the connection between the sonoma and their current incarnational being. When, the, when this connection cannot be made, the sonoma finds other pathways to feed into the system of chaos and thus creates a venting in mass deaths such as plane crashes, etc. In relation to this, you must understand that the Sonoma enters activation on the vital level within the blood. This is a magical realm in which matter and spirit join to co-create the most potent alchemy. If an incarnated soul is in opposition or great enough resistance to that dynamic, the alchemical combustion of matter and spirit in their being, there will be a buildup of dynamic pressure seeking release from that which limits the sonoma. In this instance, that limitation is matter. When enough sonomas have built up tension for release, there is a spontaneous reaction, creating a mass exodus of spirit from matter on the physical plane. I'm going to pause for a moment in the script and say that, you know, when we're seeing things like the massive amount of people perishing now in with the virus and, and in other ways as well because if we look at it statistically there are other mass evacuations on this planet they're much more severe than that even um, we have to realize that this is the kind of thing that's taking place here it's not a punishment it's not um, anything of that nature it's, it's science it's physical understanding of how matter and spirit interact and if you're not if you're not connecting highly enough to true awareness and in mass doing so as a mass consciousness, then these kinds of exoduses take place naturally, unfortunately. It's a form of balancing the system. Because of such karmic scenarios, 
the one spirit is not equally distributed in each of the Sonomas. Thus these ancient consciousness bloodlines must come together through procreation to further the opportunities given to unite the one spirit. Yet even without physical procreation, Sonomas may come together to create the golden child, the etheric offspring, which is often even a greater vehicle for bringing the Sonoma back into the one spirit consciousness. Now what Thoth is addressing here, which I didn't read previously uh, parts of, when two people come together in marriage or partnership, you know, to, and they have a physical child, uh, this bonds and creates a further direction or directive for the Sonomas. It wouldn't be necessary to do that if the awareness was higher. Um, possibly that's why we have overpopulation today, <laughs> based on the surface of the Earth. They don't have that problem in the inner Earth. Um, but it's also talking about creating the golden child. And the golden child is two people coming together and having a, a, a union in spirit that is so complete that this golden child is created an etheric offspring and it's not necessary to have it in the physical now this is not saying we shouldn't have children <laughs> it's just saying there's a balance in the system and we are out of balance of course in many ways on this planet and procreation is one of them so to continue understand that not every soul on the earth at this time has an active sonoma when we say active, we mean sonomas that contain awareness and thus activation of their consciousness, which is not the same as the host soul containing conscious awareness of the sonoma. These unaware sonoma we are calling tathi sonoma, meaning sleeping or without knowing of its form. Those sonoma who are aware of their embodiment and thus active in their process are aktet sonoma, meaning risen into the heavens or shining. The moment in time when a Tasi Sonoma becomes an Octet Sonoma is the Paroth, a moment of conjuncto in divine alchemy. So if we have two people in an intimate partnership, let us say that one, we're, we're making an example here, represents the consciousness of transmutation in their Sonoma. Transmutation is not within itself enlightenment, but the process of moving into an evolving consciousness through which enlightenment is revealed at intermittent stages of process. Of the two consciousness bloodlines of both partners, this one partner that we're speaking of here, let's call it partner A, is the younger, having its paroth at the time of the fall. Thus partner A is resonant with the consciousness of return to light and carries it in the pain of separation, of violation, as well as the memory of what once was and what will be again. Understand that the time in which soul A receives its paroth is the moment which designs the emotional lens of the birthing octet sonoma, awareness sonoma. The tasi sonoma, unaware of sleeping, of course, has no emotional orientation as it has no experience of awareness, but the octet, the aware, is given reference of its being through imprinting with the, that first birthing moment. The awareness Sonoma does not of itself have an emotional body, but when it begins to connect and work through its soul and genetic host into the conscious mind of that soul, it is in turn, it in turn registers the original imprinting of the paroth into that soul's emotional body. Remember, the paroth is that moment of contact. Thus, soul A, who is at this stage in his life, at times conscious of his octet sonoma, is experiencing the motivation of his octet paroth through his emotional being. He thus thinks in accordance with that imprinting as well. All his experiences of the sonoma 
or through the lens of its focus. Understand that this is not an inappropriate perspective. It is exactly where he needs to be at this time. Such lenses or filters are stages of sacred alchemy, not imperfections or illusions to be discarded. They are a means to the greater conjuncto. No alchemical process is complete without each stage of its formalization. Through so A's honor ek rek archetype, and this is referring to a card that was drawn for this individual, he is revealed as both the alchemist and the substances of the alchemical process. Thus, he is also the process itself. In his threefoldness, he is seen as mercurial, for the property of mercury is constant violation and reunion until the marriage is achieved. Within this processing experience, soul A consciousness is focused through the lens of his octet sonoma, his awakened ancient bloodline, which is to constantly move toward the white mercury form, which will create the alchemical marriage, the union, and the bliss. All that he sees and experiences, all that he feels and knows, resonates from this reality. Yet each sonoma, even an octet or an aware one, is a limitation unto itself, for it is not one spirit, but a fractal of one spirit. It must connect to other paros, other moments of, of awareness, that, that say, this is when I start being aware, in the linear time spectrum, other imprinted consciousness, in order to complete its purpose. For soul A, as the threefold alchemist, substance and process, it would seem to have all the ingredients but one. The azoth, which in alchemy ascends from earth to merge with the solar and lunar rays, is little revealed in the alchemical texts remaining in the current earth period. A greater understanding of this most sacred substance is given in the ancient primordial, original, unviolated, virgin earth consciousness, that which existed before the fall. The soul A, whose paroth occurred during the fall, has no direct access to this substance, which needs to be included into his process to create a new divergent earth of the future. It is at this juncture that we must turn to soul B, the other partner in the relationship, and her archetype. And from the Book of Doors, which is a, a card deck, Nu, who is the first of eight primordials. As her primordial archetype suggests, soul A, octet Sonoma's paroth, was before the fall and its lens is aligned to the primary energy of creation. This is the spiral from which arises the primordial virgin earth. As a primordial, it contains within its being all the knowingness to actualize itself, and in the higher primal reality, this is a, continu a continuous process of its existence, but it is not capable of the process in the lower form such as since such process requires transmutation, and as a primordial, there is nothing within its original beingness to transmute. Yet through soul A's soul, it is being carried into realms that have been violated, where transmutation is the necessary means of reunification. Thus soul A's octet sonoma must seek out such experience in order to lay its eggs within the sulfur fire of a generative principle, of the generative principle. This must take place so that the memory of the original being will continue and thus give birth to the future. Soul A's octet lens, or awareness lens, focuses on the azoth, which is the virgin earth of primordial world consciousness, the missing element needed to create the new virgin earth. The primordial's archetype bearers are stable in linear reality once they align to their purpose. They offer insight into what was before the separation and where the placement of this consciousness is connected through time. They see and utilize pattern but are not contained by it since their lens is of that which created pattern. Their octet awareness outpictures in the emotional body as empathy which feels its knowledge on the level of universal acceptance. 
This focus then forms their mental perspective. In order for a primordial's archetype bearer to facilitate in its octet or awareness purpose, it must be quickened to the consciousness of the fall and to the necessity to consummate the marriage of conjuncto. Otherwise, the primordial persona will gradually recede into a vacuum where it does not regenerate its sonoma into the world. So going back to soul A from the family of earth is motivated by the consciousness of return for he sees the experiences, the separation on all levels, both subtle and profound. He keenly perceives its outpicturing in the current earth of the, what Thoth is calling the second millennium. This is the, um, not a millennium in the terms of hundred years, but it's a higher count and it has to do with where we are in this separated realm at this time. Yet he must have the primordial virgin earth to create the full transmutation. When the archetype bearers of the family of earth look upon the primordials, they see themselves before the fall. There is a great sweetness in this vision, but also challenge for the focus of the primordials must be quickened by the consciousness of separation in order for the alchemist of the earth family to create with the primordials a marriage of perfection. In another way of understanding, in order for the egg laying to take place in the flame so that the magical mountain of the moon may form, the alchemist must reach back before his parot into a consciousness that is not a part of his octet or awareness sonoma and receive the eggs or seeds of this original knowledge. Conversely, the primordials through this act of the alchemist of the family of earth, must be awakened to the separation and become compassionate to this reality. In conclusion, I feel that this information which Thoth gave me those years ago is absolutely enlightening in regard to not only relationships of any kind, even business partnerships, mother, father, you know, sister, brother, whatever, relationships and also of course intimate ones it actually even with a person who's not in a relationship or is not looking at other people in their lives just themselves this gives such a a beautiful picture an understanding of how a soul is directed like a like a minnow swimming upstream from the call of its its birthing it you know it's like it's being called forward in this way Understanding one's Sonoma and Peroth allows an individual to have a sense of justice about who they are and why they are. It's not an excuse for their failings or apparent failings because everything is a learning lesson, but, you know, um, we need to, to learn and we need to grow. But it shows, it demonstrates that behind all the failings, behind the, the things that seem to limit one and keep one out of the, the, the true streaming of what they feel is their, you know, divine adventure in life, there is something that is saying, wait, yes, maybe you aren't, uh, maybe you're missing the mark in ways, but understand that behind all of that, there is a deeper, uh, path, a deeper calling that is saying the reason you're missing your mark is because you're not in sync. You're not truly awakened enough to your uh, Sonoma and thus the moment of Peroth when that occurred and created that Sonoma. So of course, how are you going to find these things out? I mean, you could have a session with me, I guess, and find them out, but that's a rather limiting approach. Um, it, it doesn't have to be defined in these terms. A person can come to realize these things in other ways. They don't have to understand Sonoma Peroth in the sense of, you know, terminology. Or even as exactly as it's presented by Thoth here. But there are people constantly coming into contact with this and understanding it on an intrinsic nature, which helps them, provides them, with access to to a, um, less self-judgment and more recognition in being able to look into the mirror and see where they are missing the mark and why. 
most people that are unwilling to look into the mirror is because they have so much self-judgment. They can't look into that mirror without judging themselves so harshly that it's just too painful. But if they understood the principle of the Sonoma and Peralth, they would more easily be able to look into that mirror and view themselves as the dweller on the threshold. All right, welcome back, everyone. So that video really, um, I mean, I, when I listened to it, I decided, okay, this is high and heavy stuff. I'm gonna put the, my smartphone uh, on the pillow next to me in bed, and I'm going to just let, let all this, you know, enter my consciousness like directly through my ear here as I'm lying in bed, I'm like. Whoa. You went to sleep. <laughs> I kind of did a little bit, <clears throat> which to me, in my experience is that's an indication of the real depth and profundity, and I'm not kidding, of, of the material, at least like, you know, for example, with Reverend William Bueller, our dear friend Bill, um, doing his Synergy Light Group work, it would just, I mean, I'd feel my brain start to just kind of sizzle and like, you know, brain cells kind of, yeah, we got to grow here to absorb this and and then I, you know i would i would get sleepy but um this is not sleepy stuff um you know in in terms of the importance to you dear viewer of your own soul history of a glimpse of the dynamic from which many if not most souls on the planet um, sprang from, came down from. And so, Maya, I would just ask you to, um, you know, in this moment, because of course we always love to bring everything back to this moment in time here in the, you know, 11 a.m. mountain time on Thursday, November 26, 2020, right? In the middle of all that. And who knows, viewer, maybe you might be viewing this even years later. And you know things that Maya and I don't about what unfolded after yeah. November 26, 2020. Oh my gosh. Um, but, you know, just to bring it into, um, you know, obviously the, you know, political, geopolitical ascension related stuff, that's one thing. Um, but into um, an understanding for us as souls, it was like, okay, with everything I'm wrestling with, with you know, with the, the stresses of daily life, of, of lockdowns and job loss and income anxieties and, you know, the, the pandemic and the rest of it, um, how this understanding of soul science, soul origin, soul history, um, in bringing this out, you know, how, uh, how can we understand it? How can we work with it? Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, just a little bit of extra information to, as backup on this. Um, as I said, I made the, the example very simple. Um, Thoth had given me various stages of descent into matter. Uh, he gave me this information in about 2000, 2001. And I have it on my Spirit Mythos website. I'll I'll put a link to that too. It might be helpful if I can remember to do that. Maybe you're gonna look at all the links at the bottom of the video. Um, and so there's a there's thousands, well, probably millions of years involved. So during that time, souls that were in the lotus reality, which was the the it's still a it's a semi-physical sort of realm, and they started coming down into the more physical as we understand it, earth. And in the, the earth that we know there were stages of development too. And the first stage was almost as uh, subtle as the Lotus reality. And then it gets more, you know, 
more firm, shall we say, terra firma, as it goes along. So there was an opportunity for a lot of souls to come down the stem, the lotus stem, Jack and the Beanstalk, into the, our current earth, not current, but earth as we understand it, um, before the point of separation where the lotus might have been a memory, but there was no feeding of that energy into the field anymore. However, that, well then, so souls started coming in after that, but where did they come from? Well, they came from places like they're coming now, from other star systems, whatever, directly in. And they were called in for various reasons. They came for various reasons. We're not gonna get into all of that. But what I wanna stress is it's not everybody came down through the lotus into this earth. They had to, after that separation point, they had to come in through other means. Now that doesn't mean that the souls that came in through other means were lesser than the souls that came through the lotus. Just another, another way to come in, you know. And um, so, but if they came in after that separation, they're going to be a little more, just naturally, a little more savvy about, you know, there's a separation here. We need to work with this, we need to understand it, and we need to get back to source. Now that's souls that have an awareness to do that. You know, there's karma, there's all this other stuff that's maybe broken people down, made, it, made their souls feel so lost, they don't know where they're going right now. And that's, that's a tragedy, but it's, it's also a fact. We can see a lot of that going on the planet now. But the souls that still have some light consciousness are going, wait a minute, you know, there's separation here, we need to solve this, we need to do something. You know, they're gonna be very proactive in that but they need in order to accomplish their mission they need to connect to souls who have a developed sense of what it was like before the separation now it's not only the souls that came through the lotus there could be other circumstances where souls came from other really highly uh, uh, whole environments on other worlds that came directly into this separated world, they still have that too, that knowledge of that. What they don't have, as I stressed on the video, is a real sense of the separation. Oh, they can see it, they're there, they're living it, it's frustrating to them and they wanna, they wanna do something about it, but they're not as connected to how to do it as the souls that came in after the separation because their Sonoma is different. But that doesn't limit them, that does not limit them. They can, they develop, when you develop relationship with other human beings, that's how this Sonoma and that Sonoma become whole because they connect, they see, they learn. Like a little child, take a little baby, mommy's singing to it, you know, and teaching it how to play the little tiny piano in front of it or whatever, just loving it. And the child just immediately starts absorbing from that parent. Well, we're the same way when we connect to like-minded beings and like-minded in spirit, but they can have very different Sonomas. And so when when you, when, excuse me for interrupting. When you're using the word Sonoma here, you said to me that this is a sort of bloodline. Yeah, and then there's the um, Peroth is sort of more your, your sense of purpose because of when you came in. Is that right? No, no. The Peroth is simply the point of entry. So if you had take, take a pin and you stick it in the map, the pin is the Peroth. Boom, there marks the spot. The, the Sonoma is your awareness, your field of reference, and your ancient bloodline. And, and when I speak of bloodline, I'm talking about spiritual kinetic energy that is literally intelligent uh, uh, source of being in your blood. And in the genetics too, of course, that's another part of the whole picture. But those speaks of it as an ancient bloodline because it connects to the lifetime that you first had where, you're, that where the, you first entered the, the, this physical world experience. The pin in the, in the map is the Peroth, but the Sonoma is, is yours. That's what you own. That's your field that you landed in. You know, the spaceship comes down in this little perimeter and there you are in that field, and that field is yours. You, 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 you understand your field, but over the fence, that's somebody else's field, or a lot of right. our souls over there, see? So I know it's not, it's not the easiest thing to grasp, but when you get it, I swear to you, when you get it, it goes bing, 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 <laughs> and it starts connecting the whole thing, you know? Right, so um, 
the Sonoma and the bloodline, we're talking about this is a paragenetic bloodline. We're okay. talking about your soul genetics. In the exactly. Soul. Your soul genetics, which can affect, of course, your genetics, physical genetics as well. But the soul genetics is what carries the ancient bloodline because it goes through all a sundry family trees. But the Sonoma, that's where your Perov landed. That's where your little spaceship landed. And no matter how many lifetimes you've had, how many paragenetic, uh, you know, places you've gone um, and, and genetic fields that you've incarnated in, you carry that, that, you know, this is how it is. And you, it changes with, I mean, parts of it change for you in your, in your field of reference, but that Sonoma doesn't change. That place where you landed, that man that's with you, and you're going to, it's going to come out. It's going to come out in the, the decisions you make, the relationships you make, the karma and dharma you create. All of those things, all of those things come out of the Sonoma because the Sonoma is connected directly to your creation star. <laughs> that's another topic, but that's the star your soul began in. And it could be anywhere in the universe, but uh, it's where the decision was made on some level of consciousness or beyond consciousness where you were going to land on this planet. So when you speak of, you know, when you came down in your little spaceship, you're speaking figuratively. Oh, yes, of course. Yes. Right. <laughs> I just thought it was important to point that out because, right. <clears throat> you know, there are spaceships and they do land. Right. People do get out, right. you know. <clears throat> um, so this is just when talking about a descent from the Lotus reality. Um, I created an air balloon. <laughs> An air balloon is a little more figuratively accurate, right? So we're talking about, um, obviously at some point, we're talking about taking physical incarnation. And you described to me earlier, before we began recording, the process by which, you know, the evolutionary process by which the physical expression that we had as souls in lotus reality began to sort of densify um, and become more um, elaborately manifested in a form suitable to earth yeah right? it's, it's where that's where earth becomes the terra firma before then yeah you had an earth under your feet but there's a whole different kind of energy to it and gradually that shifted until it was knock on wood you know you really feel like there's nothing else because it's so solid. But of course, we know it's not solid. We all, just about everybody knows now that when you look at an atom or something, there's giant fields of space, you know, every their table is just filled with space, but you, it doesn't feel that way when you touch it. So you feel so limited now, even though right. you kind of know that's not true. Your every sense in you tells you that it is true. Whereas before all of that happened, there was an earth under your feet, but you had a whole different reality around it, which I can't even know, much less put into words. Okay, quick little tangent question here. So, terra firma is becoming more firma, right? <laughs> but actually it is, but right now, the space we're in, because we wanted to bring it back to the now, it's becoming less firma. Right, because we're on the ascension timeline? And- we're in this. Uh, Exactly. The star gestation. People are having missing time more. And I'm not talking about just being taken up by little gray guys. I'm talking about real feelings of time shifting, you know, that, that's not connected to that in your own inner space. I have a lot of people tell me that happens to them. And they're having more people seeing things in the ether, seeing things that shouldn't be there. Um, you know, there's all kinds of shifting going on. And all of these sightings of um, not just the little metal UFOs, but the, the intra-dimensional experiences. I know we have more ability to film them now, but there's really more of it happening, or we're seeing it more. You know, we're actually right. witnessing these things in the clouds and these holes opening up in the sky, and you see these videos on YouTube. I mean, all of this is part of the shifting of our terra, terra firma to become New Earth. Okay, well, going back in time, as we were describing this moment when souls are coming down the, the lotus stem, you know, the, the stem from the lotus reality, and 
the earth is becoming um, more terra firma, as you say. Mm -hmm. at, at what point, and you've described different epochs during this dynamic, during this process, which lasted over a period of millions of years, but then again, time was counted differently at that time. But I'm curious, at what point in the evolution of Earth and the conscious beings inhabiting it, did the inner Earth reality kick into being? Is, does ah. that figure into this? Yes, that's a good question. Well, what I've learned so far about that is that there was a, there was a point where the Earth literally did a twist. It's like, it's like if you had um, an outer sheath to the earth, energy sheath, and then you had this forming terra firma earth in the middle and you sort of just twisted it like that. And the outer sheath went one direction and the, and the inner, you know, the earth earth went another. And, and as that occurred, and I've mentioned this before in some other shows, um, the, uh, the dimensions were shifted slightly to allow the hollow earth, the inner earth to form. And there was a period of time where it formed. There wasn't any life in there at that point, but it was forming because there's evidence of, of, I, you know, of um, volcanic action in there. Nothing that's going on now, but, but when I saw some of this on my journeys, um, you know, I said, well, that looks like a volcanic, a crater, a big one, and they're all living in it, you know, and as yes, that was a long time ago. We have no, you know, surface, surface volcanic action, surface and their surface now, but it, it happened. So all of this had to take place, and exactly when that twist occurred, I would say that it was somewhere in, in regard to the point where people were even able to come down the stem of the lotus. That's what I'm getting right now. Because previous to that, you could there was there wasn't no stem, at least not one that could you know you could access it. Souls could literally go down into the into the the the, the navel, the the core. Before the, the lotus was you know just receiving nutrients from this sort of earthen condition that was not yet ter terra firma. But when it started being terra firma, that's when the door was open, and it would open. I'm seeing now at the same time, or more or less, you know, after the twist occurred, because that twist was not just about creating uh, a dimension inside the earth, which all planets that are real planets do, by the way, one way or another, it might not have a Lotus story connected, but there, that's part of the dynamic of creating these worlds. Um, so when that happened, other things happened as well. The earth became more, the physical earth, semi-physical earth became more realized. And as it did, the lotus reality could, you know, the souls could begin to say, consider if they wanted to go down that stem. So there's, there's a, there's a syn synergy there. I can't say it all happened instantly, whether there's several thousands years that, you know, I don't know because even time was different then. And this is one yeah. of the things why, and I won't get off on this, but just, just a little teeny thing. When Thoth talks about, you know, um, what do you call it, radiocarbon dating? He says it can be very accurate, but there are certain things that simply cannot be radiocarbon dated because some of the remnants of the, that are there from, the, from a shifting field in time, various shifting fields in time, not just one, because we also have this millennium thing and all of that, uh, don't register properly in, in uh, radiocarbon dating. So that's just an interesting little side there. Yeah. Well, one thing that occurs to me when we're talking about the lotus reality and the, the stem, the descent down the lotus stem, and you use the you know kind of jocular reference to Jack and the Beanstalk, mm -hmm. right? Jack mm -hmm. climbs up the beanstalk, up, 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 you know, to this realm of giants, right? Yeah. And I'm struck by the, the symbolism and, and the metaphor here when we're talking about our descent as souls from the lotus stem. This is almost literally an analogy <laughs> to Vedic and yoga, you yeah. know, that the medulla oblongata is where the, um, it's our reconnection 
through the sound of the sacred word, Om, through meditation on it to draw our consciousness back up the stem of the spine to reunion with source. So it's like as above, so below. Microcosm, macrocosm, you know, that um, literally the practice of, of many different forms of meditation, particularly the ones generally referred to as Kundalini, um, Kriya Yoga, the technique taught by Paramahansa Yogananda and the Mahavatar Babaji lineage um, is of this kind, where it's literally about bringing the energy and consciousness back up the stem of the spine to reunion with the lotus reality, which is literally the thousand petaled lotus it is referred to in the brain, where cosmic consciousness is experienced. It's what enables the human vehicle, the soul in the human vehicle to experience reunion with source, cosmic consciousness, samadhi, is because of the thousand petaled lotus, which we need to reascend the stem. Uh, so I, I just thought I'd, you know, I'd point out this beautiful symmetry between you know, our own ancient soul history, soul science, of there having been this <clears throat> sort of much more divine realm, much less separation from source in the lotus reality. And down the stem we came, and you know, the ones who, who have a memory of it are like, well, hey, uh, separation? Well, there's no separation, you know, but, uh, but on the other hand, I'm separated. How did this happen? Yeah. And then, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then the souls who come in later, it's like, you're kind of daffy. I mean, what's your deal? You don't get it, do you? You know, about, uh, because we, and I think I'm probably in this category, you know, um, don't have that still visceral, you might, even the visceral means guts, you know, um, and, and we're obviously we're talking about higher centers here, but I'll say visceral, you know, awareness of, you know, of the indissolubility of our connection to source, that in fact, there is no separation. As, as Yogananda says in identifying what is, you know, self-realization, self-realization is the knowing in body, mind, and soul that we are one with God, that God's omnipresence is our omnipresence, that we do not have to pray that it come to us, that it is not merely near us at all times, but that God's omnipresence is our omnipresence. And all we have to do is deepen our knowing. Oh, is that all? Great. <laughs> okay. I may work on that for a few incarnations. But it's, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's that reality that for the souls who... Um, who came down before, there's this moment. If you could describe a little bit more of what you're referring to in the video as the fall, where you know there was this moment where it's kind of like the mothership pulled up the rope. All right, okay. The yeah. epochs wherein you could do this, you could come down, that's over. Um, have fun, kids. Good luck getting back up. Right, well, no door is absolutely nailed shut, but it's often closed. And the difference is that if one can access many beautiful infinite states of reality, if they but believe, if they move into a, a higher climate in their inner being to do so. But the difference is they couldn't just physically ascend into the lotus anymore. Um, not now, but the Lotus is going to be joining. I don't know. I'm not going to go off on that. But anyway, so what was your question? <laughs> I lost I'm having it. trouble remembering it myself at this point. Um, oh. I think it was, you know, just simply pointing out that asking you to go into a little bit more description of this moment that you're referring to oh, as the fall. Yeah, yeah, right, the right, right. Moment where it's a before and after, it's a key before and after for the Sonoma in determining. Your parole, when did you come in? What's your orientation? What was that moment? That not moment, you know, probably hundreds of thousands of years yeah. or whatever, where suddenly it's like, okay, there's what's called the fall, which is a biblical term, you know, for 
Adam and yeah. Eve, the serpent, the apple, and all the rest of it, the fall of man away from divine awareness, and oh my God, I'm naked, and I'm going to have, you know, women will have children with pain, and off I go well, waiting that, for the Virgin Mary and Jesus stuff. to show up. Yeah, yeah, that's a yeah. lot of difficult Perfect. things that are rather distorted. Some of it works, but yeah. uh, the fall is something with those started using that term with me, I don't know, in the 80s or whatever. So now he said, now understand, I'm using this biblical term, so we'll kind of relate, so you kind of understand what I'm talking about. But this whole fall thing is not understood properly, and it's not really a fall and blah, 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 blah. You know, so that's how he started using the term. And that's when I, see, I don't use it very much anymore if at all. But when I was reading material to you, I wrote it that long time ago. So now, let's, do, let's move up here. I prefer to say the time of the great separation. And um, so that would have spanned a period of time, but you see in those days, time was different than it is now. Not only in a, lint, a, a way of counting it, I don't even know, think they counted it in those days. Uh, it was the way it interacted with consciousness. And that's very similar, actually, the way it's going to be in the newer stuff. So the way it interacts with consciousness and time, from their perspective, it was there and now it's here. Because the time that, that moved into this field where, you know, suddenly you say, well, I really can't go back there anymore. There was a great period of time and period people lived through that. But the way that a human being absorbed time in that in that period of time was not in a uh, what do you call it, historical order. For instance, okay, we have history books, and they may be very accurate, but you know they've got their say, their dogmatic say. This Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and this year, and then this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and then we had this in, in the Constitution of the United States, and then founding fathers did this, and then this, and now we have COVID. <laughs> You know, it goes through this this whole track, you know, and we're all on it together. We learn it, we memorize it, we take tests on it. Yes, this is what happened. This is the, and we've got just, we've got this linear field just going <laughs> through our brains. That didn't happen then. So they didn't have history. And it, it, they didn't miss it. They didn't need it because they had gnosis. And gnosis is knowing everything you need to know and not having to worry with stuff you don't need to know. <laughs> so, right. so that's why it's hard for me to say, well, it happened right here because that's how, that's how it yeah. works. Yeah, stuff you didn't need to know, like in what year was Millard Fillmore inaugurated as president? You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's bring it back to understanding in a very as practical as we can manner for now how we can use this knowledge first listen to the video a few times notes, the things that are pertinent to you that you and you get if you don't get a bunch of stuff here just say okay i'll get that but oh i understand this and you know right make a little note or something about it because once you start looking first at yourself how you react to things how you naturally deduce come to deductions you know choices the way you see the world and you think of someone else that you know and it's a good person you love them but they really see things certain things at least very differently from you and you go how can that happen we're so connected in so many ways and yet they see this this way you know they approach it they look at it this way and i approach and look at it such a different way well people think okay well it's karma it's the way you're raised in the family it's your genetics you know, but all of those things are based on your Sonoma, where your Perot landed, where that little balloon came down and landed. Because the Sonoma is the energy field that comes from your, your star creation. And your star creation said, when you enter this world, young lady, Mr. Man, you're going you're gonna to land right here. Because this equates mm. to your creation star. So it's a very, very basic thing. Now it can change in a way. I mean, it doesn't change. I shouldn't say that. It can be enlightened. It can be... Um, transcended? Yeah, not even transcended, but adjusted. Uh, 
un understanding other things that come into your space because a human being is a the absorption field. We absorb everything, man. We absorb Coca-Cola commercials. I mean, we absorb everything. <laughs> and But we have no filters or we don't really have very many filters. Uh, and that's a problem. But uh, all of the stuff that we're trying to filter out and do it, but it's all based on how our Sonoma, where we landed as the Perot, looks at things. And yet it's been adjusted by new absorptions coming in. Now, some of those absorptions aren't that good, as I just stated. And right. some, some are very enlightening and they help that soul adjust, you know, and, and, and expand their field of, of, of environmental field of expression and un knowledge and understanding. So certainly you can grow. You aren't stuck in your Sonoma by any means. But the Sonoma is the first place you look in the closet when you're lost. <laughs> when you're uh -huh. lost, you like, can't think of it. Let me go in the closet. Oh, the Sonoma. Yes. <laughs> and you go, yes. I right. 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 You know, so, so anyway, um, where was I in all of this? So when when you when you start interacting with others, and and sometimes you receive signals that you absorb that are incomplete. Let's call them incomplete. They cre they have a lot of illusion connected to them, a lot of misinformation. But you're looking for something because you're lacking something that you need to broaden your spectrum outside of your Sonoma. And if you don't have awareness filters set into your being, those that you cultivate from your higher soul beingness, you can get pretty lost with all this other information trying to help you out with your Sonoma. Mm. And um, that's what's, you know, and, and, and a lot of it, we're really seeing a lot of it on the planet now. And we all experience it to a degree but there's some people out there that have been lost for quite a long time. I mean, lifetimes. And, you know, they just have whatever reasons come up that messed up their, their, their compass. Their Sonoma, in a way, is kind of a compass. It's just, you know, it's crazy right now because they're just desperate. Yeah. Desperate to find the path that enlightens, that allows their Sonoma to, to be informed, you know. To allow the compass, the insoma, to be informed, so it can it can uh, broaden the horizon. Right, and that w could shed light on okay, what's my true soul work? Right, what's my orientation, perspective, drive, momentum, dynamic, such that I am looking in this direction and not this one. That I'm, yeah. drawn. you know, I could give an example of um, you know a friendship that I have. Um, within our spiritual community where it became clear, and you shared this um, with us, that, you know, in this friendship, each of us had a, you know, particular perspective as a result of, you know, that point, the Parof, where we landed, you know, the Sonoma, and that, that mine, and this actually did help me as I began to understand it, you know, in terms of, okay, let's call it a 50,000 year arc of a soul dynamic, right? <clears throat> Where I came in basically, you know, what in India they call a Kshatriya caste orientation, which is the, the warrior and ruler class. So like, okay. We got it. We've got a job to do. It's kind of a battle, and uh, we need to focus on strategy and <clears throat> immediate um, tactics in pursuit of that strategy in order to get the heck back up the lotus stem. And uh, so it tends to be, you know, you might call it loosely speaking a Templar kind of orientation in terms of the guardian priesthood, the Jedi, guardian priesthood, Jedi, Jedi uh, of ancient Egypt. And then um, my friend within our community came in at a different moment where the perspective was much more like further afield, bigger picture, looking down the road past the immediate strategic, tactical, you know, linear, we need to make this happen, um, orientation to, you know, like a bigger field where it's about, um, Anticipating problems in advance, 
from the perspective of a, of a big picture and an intuitive connection to how it will unfold. Mm -hmm. And understood, you know, um, each perspective understanding the other, it's like, oh, isn't it wonderful that you have this immediate, linear, tactical, strategic, let's get it done perspective, and that I have the big picture looking down the road to the problems that are coming. Isn't it wonderful the way we can integrate this, <laughs> right? Well, you know, um, <clears throat> in practice, in relationship, um, transcending that and integrating that can be tricky because it's just, it's instinctive. You just do it almost without thinking. It's like, well, this is the way any rational being would view the universe, of course, the immediate strategical, tactical things in front of us. Well, what's the point of seeking out problems down the road that aren't here yet? And the person with the bigger perspective would go, what's the point of focusing on what's immediately in front of you if you don't know the bigger picture and what's coming down? You know, um, <laughs> and so it, it can be um, very frustrating for both. So I give that just as an example of how this can play out um, exactly. in the real world, in relationships. Um, yeah, I, exactly, Michael. And I, I, I don't mean to sidetrack here, but I just have to say this. The way the light is falling on your... Right, computer, yeah, it's because I am, like I am phasing web. out into 5D. I'm phasing yes, out into 5D as we speak. You it, know, it looks like that. It, it happens all the time. This whole... Oh, there we go. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this whole ascension thing, it's just, it's just people are talking to me. I'm phasing out into 5D. Right. Oh, my God, Michael, all right. No, it was just a trick. Uh, but, yes, that's that's very much the case. It's difficult to, to actually uh, live the alignment. You can see it. Oh, isn't that beautiful how this could come together with that? But to actually do it is another matter. But it's not a hopeless case by any means. And people do do it, some of them just automatically, and others learn how that adjustment works. As I said, you don't have to know about the Sonoma and the Perot to, to get it. People get it on other levels. They, get, they can use different terms or no terms at all, but they get that there's something going on here that they need to kind of, you know, look at from a different perspective, and that helps them. But, uh -huh. uh, but I think that also knowing about it a little bit, you know, makes a difference too. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this is the point where in a lot of videos you would see on YouTube where the person would go and no doubt you would like to know your particular Sonoma and Perot. And for only twenty nine ninety five, special this week, because you're tuning in, we can give you your highly specifically designed Sonoma Perot report that will help you illuminate the path towards perfect relationship with your soulmate. <laughs> right? So um, I think it would be, you know, which would be a service, and that would be cool. And um, so in lieu of that, because naturally I'm thinking if, you know, if I were a viewer out there pulling all this in and going, you know, this sounds actually, this makes sense. I wonder where I came in. I wonder what my unique perspective, growth oriented perspective is and, and why my, you know, my wife or my husband or my girlfriend has got this totally wacky pro. And wouldn't I like to know? Um, so I, I only mention it in terms of reminding everybody that Reverend Maya does, in fact, um, give personalized readings. She wouldn't be pitching it herself, so I'm going to pitch it for her, okay? Um, and they are beautiful and illuminating and well worth uh, the time and effort. And, you know, of course, the fairly modest compensation uh, she receives uh, for that service, so. There, I've made the plug for okay. you folks out there um, to pursue it or not. Yeah. Uh, we'll have a, there's a little clip at the end of um, our video here where, um, you know, where that's emphasized. And of course, if you can donate to um, the Sacred Academy um, work, there'll also be that. Um, each donation goes a very long way um, here in the mountains of Colorado and like and share and subscribe and all that good stuff. It helps get the, you know, to those souls out there who are supposed to tune into this. Right now it's, you know, in the hundreds or thousands, maybe someday it will be hundreds of thousands, we'll see. 
as the Ascension timeline unfolds. Now I know our um, the video was on the longer side, and yeah. uh, we have just in terms of our schedule and and your schedule today, uh, you know, not quite as much time as we usually do. So is is there a, um, a sort of wrap up perspective that you would like to give in in um, encouraging people how to use this understanding? Well, first, I'd like to say that there's something wonky with my email. It's an old email on my computer. It's not online, and it's a big deal to change it over, which I'd like to do at some point. But I'm having problems, and I've been having them increasingly for a while. I get plenty of mail, but then there's mail that I don't get. So I don't know why. It doesn't bounce to the other person or anything. It just disappears. So if you're contacting me you're, and you don't get a, an answer from me in like two days, send it again. You know, keep a copy, keep sending it. <laughs> and I always answer within two days unless my computer's broken or, you know, I send it or something. <laughs> so, so, so please, you know, don't give up on me. I'm not ignoring you. It's just that I have this particular problem that I haven't been able to solve yet. So that's out of the way. Do I have any conclusion? Well, not really. I think we talked about it so much but you, in such a short period of time. Well, my only thing to say is, you know, I, I really feel that it can help a lot of people if you just kind of listen to it more than once, you know, and make some notes maybe of the things that really resonate with you. And then explore in your own inner being what it means to you. You know, that's important. All right, then. So, again, happy Thanksgiving uh, yeah. to everyone here on November 26, 2020. And thanks for being with us. And again, please do, if this was valuable to you, you know, share and like and subscribe, donate if you're able to. We deeply appreciate it. And we will see you next time here on Blue Star Rising. Thanks for being with us. God bless us, everyone. Bye for now.